Uh, real quickly, we not only, I was showing you this slide, uh, the seven churches almost beautifully portray church history. They also portray the seven ty types of Christians that are in every church. In fact, this morning, well, actually, it's, now it's afternoon because it's 12.02. There are probably every type of Christian that you find in Revelation in this room. There's the distracted ones in Ephesus, you know, they lost their first love. They're the refined ones, the ones that are suffering either physical or financial problems. They're just the compromised. I bet in a group this size, there are secret, hidden, known only to God and you sins in this group, just like there were in Pergamos, deceived the people in Thyatira. They thought they were great, and God said, you are horrible, uh, your behavior. Uh, stupefied the people in Sardis. He, he took their pulse. There was no pulse, no love, no hunger, no direction. Philadelphia, they were impassioned. I mean, they, you couldn't get them to stop loving and seeking the Lord. And then Laodicea, they were the, hey, you can't impress me. They were totally uh, uncommitted to a devout following of Christ. Well, now we're in hour three. This is where you should be in your notes. Now, someone, what page is that? Do you guys have page numbers? There's no page numbers? What, what, that's page 43. Bill, Master, Sergeant, Staff, Captain, Yep, 43. Got it. Why Jesus chastens his church? Two reasons. He wants us fruitful. He wants us pleasing God. And so let's look at that. Number one, remember, Revelation is the only book that captures Christ's final message. Last words are important. Jesus says, there's so much to think about. Think about this. And what are the seven lessons we can get from chapter one? Number one, Christ is revealed for his church. Never forget that the whole book of Revelation was written for the church. There is no more timely part of the Bible than this. This is what we're supposed to know. Why? Because we're being plunged into a time that is more talked about than anything else in the Bible. We're in the last days. How do I know that? It says it in Hebrews. It says, Hebrews 2, God hath in these last days spoken through his Son. The last days started from the cross onward. If that was the last days 2,000 years ago, we're in the really last days today. How do I know that? God says the world is going to end when a coalition of nations that involve Persia, all of the nations surrounding Turkey, and basically the, the, the nations that we would call the Muslim world, and Russia march on Israel. Guess what? Persia was renamed Iran in 1940s. Iran is in the newspaper. In fact, if you search Google and look up Iran, Israel, every day there's some horrible thing that the military commander of Iran is saying about Israel. Like yesterday, we will destroy them. The day before, we will really destroy them. The day before that, we will erase them from... Never in history... Has it been a setting where Iran, who possesses atomic weapons, with the backing of Russia and China today, is threatening and moving their bases into Syria to attack Israel? I mean, we're, we're at the end of days. And the Bible says it's what God wants us to know. He's revealed for his church. Number one, what does he reveal? We're his bondservants. What's a servant? Someone that does the will of another. Are you his servant today? Yes or no? Do you want to do his will? Do you tell him that? I mean, if you are in love with someone, tell him. If you're in love with Christ, tell him. We need to be more overt and tell him, I want to serve you. Um, responding to God brings blessings. That, we already covered that in chapter 1, verse 3. Sunday is the Lord's day. Uh, Jesus wants, that's really supposed to be number two. I would fix it, but my numbering's off. Responding is number two. Sunday is the Lord's Day. That's number three. Should be in your notes. Revelation was for the local churches, verse 11. And I already told you this, but Christ's attention is on us, his church. Well, what does all that mean? 
Christ's priority is maintaining our health. That's why he comes around in this white robe, like a health inspector, a priest, looking over his church. The most important thing is that we're spiritually healthy. If we're healthy, then people see Christ in us. Um, I was, and I'll just tell you this real quickly, I was going to speak at a men's retreat, and um, I love speaking at men's retreats, but I was a local church pastor, and, and the church takes all your time. So I only had enough time to study for the men's retreat on the airplane. So I was flying a couple of flights to speak at a men's retreat. So I was there, and I, it was really a blessing. It was an empty airplane. Uh, we lived at that time where American Airlines fixes their planes, so they often ship them out empty to go to the hubs. And so I got on one of those on a scheduled flight, and I was the only person on there. And they were getting ready to shut the door. I was the only person on the plane. It's kind of eerie, you know. But I thought, this is an answer to prayer. I can study my Bible the whole time. They'll just keep bringing me drinks, you know, Diet Cokes and cranberry juice. So I was so excited, and I had my Bible out, my marker pens like this, and just before they shut the door, this guy walks on. And he walks all the way down the aisle, and I'm sitting right there, and he sits across the aisle from me. So I turned a little bit in my chair and kept studying. We took off. He pushed the button. <clears throat> Stewardess came. He said, I'd like a $3 bottle of alcohol. You know, they sell these. They look like Cracker Barrel syrup bottles. They're this big. <laughs> Drank the whole thing. <laughs> Could I have another? Drank the whole thing. I was sitting over there reading my Bible thinking, this drunk is sitting next to me. So he got a little inebriated. He's sitting this far from me on the other side of the aisle. We're the only two people on the airplane. And he leans back in his chair. He's getting a little warm from all that alcohol. And he goes... What are you doing over there on your side of the plane? And I didn't even look at him. I said, I am studying the Bible. I thought that would shut him up. He said, you're studying the Bible? I have a question about the Bible. So I put my finger where I was so I wouldn't lose my place. And I looked at him to be polite. I said, yep, yeah. what's your question? And this intox slightly intoxicated man said, my Hispanic housekeeper. By the way, he was a very wealthy doctor. He had an anesthesiological group of 20 doctors that worked for him. He lived in a mega mansion in the old part of town and had servants. So that's, but he was scared to death to fly, thence the buzz and drink, you know, because he's afraid to die on an airplane. So he was trying to forget about it by drinking. He said, my Hispanic housekeeper, every day when she sees me in the house, she'll see me in the house and she'll say, you go hell. <laughs> and he says, then I'll see her again and she'll say, you go hell. That's all she knew in English. And so he's sitting here. He said, why would my Hispanic housekeeper, who doesn't even know English, say to me every day, you go hell. So I'm sitting here with my finger on the verse. I said, because you probably are. And I turned in my seat and went right back to studying. Can you believe it? And one second after that, the Holy Spirit hit me with a bat. <laughs> what? Not really. You know I'm teasing. I thought, this guy wants me to share the gospel with him. Here, we're all alone on the airplane. He's scared to death to die. He's drinking alcohol. His Hispanic housekeeper is probably a charismatic Christian and, and is trying to witness to him, doesn't know English. And he sat across the row from me, and I have my Bible open. And I turned and earnestly shared the gospel, pulled out a gospel tract that I always carry with me, circled the verses, found out his last name was Bevilacqua. His uncle was the cardinal of Baltimore. I mean, we're talking about... <clears throat> this guy was from such a deep Roman Catholic line, earnestly longing to know the gospel, never understood anything about grace, scared to die, sits across the road from me, the plane lands, 
And I wrote my name on the back of the track and my cell phone number. And he ran, and I ran. I found out later he was going big game hunting. I mean, that's what rich people do, you know, going to get another lion or something for his wall. And I gave him that gospel track, and I wrote his name, Paul Bevilacqua, in my calendar. And I started praying for him faithfully every day. Six months later, I was back. I, I did the retreat, went back to my church, was serving, and I was between first and second service, getting my notes back in my Bible like this, and I was walking down the hall, and I noticed someone was in my area, so I moved over, so they moved over, so I moved over. I didn't look up, you know what I mean. It was because I was hurrying back to the pulpit, looking at my notes, and finally, we did this little dance back and forth, and I finally looked up, and it was the guy from the airplane. I said, hello, he said, hello, Dad. He said, I want to tell you what happened. And I stood in the hallway and he said, did you know we both ran off that airplane? You were going to your flight, I was going to mine, our connecting flights. He said, you gave me that gospel track. He said, I was so afraid to die. He said, I got on my knees at the first bank of seats in the airport. Now you talk about humble. He said, I put that track on the seat in front of me and on my knees I read it aloud and did the little prayer at the end. And he said, God completely changed my life. And he said, I wanted to tell you. And I thought, did you know I'm not an evangelist? But God says, if you just share the gospel, if you're healthy, you'll want to share the gospel. If you're healthy, you'll want to read the Bible. If you're healthy, you like to memorize scriptures. If you're healthy, you like to pray. If you're healthy, you hate sin. See, Jesus his priority is maintaining the health of his church. And true believers are overcomers. That doesn't mean you never do anything wrong. It means that you have the power and you feel the power from the Spirit of God to say no to sin. If you've never been saved from sin, you've never been saved from hell. Because the Spirit of God within us, he can overcome any bondage to any sin. And we need to start experiencing spiritual health and saying no to sin. Jesus keeps overcomers spiritually healthy. God only chastens his own children. And, and I already showed you that in Hebrews 12. Okay, the next section is Jesus is always encouraging fruitfulness. And what he's asking is, is my life pleasing to God? How do I know? Well, how healthy do you want to be is the question. Number one, God is very concerned about your diet. Did you know that? Christians are off on all these crazy diets. You know, they have the Daniel diet and the Nehemiah diet and all this. God has already told us what the diet is. It's in Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Let me ask you this. Can you not make it throughout a whole day without this or without this? I meet young people that sleep with this. I don't know if they let you do that here, but they sleep with this. They don't want to miss any buzz or vibration or tap or poke or anything. They just, ooh. This, that's kind of boring to them. The Bible? Oh, I got an assignment. A whole book I have to read. Ugh. That's a sign of sickness. Because this, in fact, one of the nice things you learn to do is you put your phone to bed and then you put your Bible on top of it, and when you wake up in the morning, you go, oh, I should seek Christ before everything else. See, it's a constant choice in every generation. God is also concerned about your exercise. Uh, exercise is that we're supposed to be denying ungodliness. He wants us to exercise ourselves toward godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7. And Titus 2, 11, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, verse 12 and 13 of Titus 2. We're supposed to live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's not for old people. You'll never be in the future what you're not becoming today. If you don't have a hunger for the word today, you won't have it in the future. You'll never be in the future what you're not becoming today. God is concerned about our weight. You know, everybody in America is concerned about their weight, you know, and all these Everybody is, you know, their body. There's such a worship of the body. You know what God says? Lay aside, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, every weight, the sin that so easily besets us. 
He doesn't want us weighted down with sin so we can run the race that he has planned for us. Well, how do we get into health? Start a regular three-part workout. You read the Bible, you apply the Bible, and you repent of anything that it says. That's why those prayers in your journal are so important. You actually are going to comb through the book of Revelation and from every section and from every chapter uh, and from even every church, look for one thing that God told them he wanted from them and then say, God, that's what I want for me. I want to love you like I did at the beginning. You know, talk about marriage and my wonderful wife, Bonnie. Did you know that Bonnie is my first wife? And she is my best friend. And she is the closest person on earth to me. Did you know what the Bible says that the mark of a godly woman is in Titus 2? That they, do you know what the first priority for every young woman was in, in the early church? Titus 2 says this. Teach the younger women to love their husbands. That's Titus 2.5. What is that? The word is phil androis. To be best friends with your husband. Do you know what most young ladies are? Best friends with their mother, best friends with their sisters, best friends with their girlfriends. When they have children, best friends with their children, and they have a husband. Wow. Do you know what the first lesson for every young lady was? They were taught by older godly women how to love their husbands and become best friends on earth. That's what God wants because he wants us to reflect the relationship that he has engaged to us. He is our husband-to-be and we're his bride. And he wants the bride, the church, and the women of the church to reflect that love back. To please God and be fruitful, Ephesus learned they had to love the Lord most, more than their cell phone in our vernacular. To please God and be fruitful, Pergamos had to learn that they needed to start separating from sin. Uh, we each need to start working out. In fact, turn to Hebrews 10, and I want to show you something uh, that's good to practice. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 in your Bibles. Now, a lot of you have heard this one. It's the verse all the pastors say on Sunday morning about coming to church Sunday night. Hebrews 10, uh, you know, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But look at the context of it. Uh, verse 22 of Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a true heart. Oh, by the way, I have to, let me see. Hold on, you guys, for just a second. I have to do something. I want to see how far I have to get. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh. Oh. We're on the 71st slide. Well, I'll tell you this anyway. <clears throat> Hebrews 10.22 talks about what to do when you've had an enslaving sin in your life. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? When I was, uh, I didn't want to be in the ministry. I surrendered when I was nine. But when I was in high school, I finished high school in three years. I didn't like it, so I got it over quick. I went after school and did a lot of extra stuff, and they let me out my junior year. And so I started my senior year. I was still a senior, but I just worked. And I did all kinds of stuff and had fun and got as far away from the Lord as I could get. And one of the things I did is I became a truck driver. And I used to drive the big truck and deliver stuff. And I would, now this is in the 70s, I would back my truck up to the loading dock and pull the, you know, put the air brake on. I jumped down, and I'd come with my little clipboard to the loading dock. And in the 1970s, the world was very much fixated on the hippie movement and Haight Ashbury and you know the Beatles and all that stuff. And and every loading dock that I ever went to in Michigan when I delivered, every place I delivered had on the wall life-size pornography posters. This is pre-internet. So they would buy these gigantic posters 
for the men, because men worked in these places and truck drivers, and it was just part of their life. So I would, you know, I was from this good Christian home, and I was, you know, knew what was right, so I'd come with my little clipboard like this, and I'd slide it up, and as I would, you know, look up to see if they signed it, you would see all that filth. I mean, that's, now that's nothing. Anybody in one second can get that on their phone. But it used to be, you know, you had to either buy a bad magazine or go to a bad theater or go to a loading dock and look at all that stuff. Well, one of the things about our mind, remember we have this video, three trillion videotapes that's always running? No matter how much I didn't look and would slide my clipboard, you know how you can kind of, I can see my hand right to there. You know, you have peripheral vision. And so gradually over that year, a lot of stuff that I never chose to look at in my life, I gradually got on my videotape system. And when I got 19 years old, started reading the Bible through, the most terrible thing that the devil would get me with was, what about all that stuff that you saw when you were a truck driver? And so I remember I was in the book of Hebrews memorizing. One of the things I did in school is I memorized the book of Hebrews, all 303 verses. And I got to chapter 9, verse 14, and I'll still always remember I was pacing the floor memorizing my verses and this is what I was doing Hebrews 9 14 how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from works that lead to death Hebrews 9 14 how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience I said Lord is it actually possible for you to clean out videotapes stuff that that I don't want that's there I said I I believe you so I said Lord I would like you to empty the filing cabinets of that whole year of stuff by the way if you tried to escape from the loading dock and went to the bathroom of the place you were delivering the whole bathroom was just stacks of all these pornography magazines that's just how the world was, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now it's all on the internet. But then it was just in paper. Well, I got to chapter 10, verse 22, and look what it says. Let us draw near. God says, I want you, my children, to draw near in full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and washed with pure water. And I'll never forget Hebrews 9, 14, stopping and saying, I would like you to cleanse that out so I can, Hebrews 10, 22, draw near in full assurance of faith, being cleansed. Well, that's the context of the verses that we're looking at right there at the bottom of that slide, verses 24 and 25. Because he says, all of us have something that we're asking God to deliver us from, cleanse us from, uh, give us the strength to resist and say no to, but look what it's about. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. This is the accountability part. Did you know what one of the greatest things is to, to grow spiritually? Have someone that challenges you about your spiritual growth. When I was a youth pastor, remember I said I used to walk around like this? I used to walk around as a youth pastor and I set up with my students, every one of them, I said, when I see you anywhere this week, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, where you are in the Bible, and I want you to tell me what you've learned in the scriptures. Well, I, I mean, it's easy on Sunday when you're walking around like this because they're in their seats and they can't get away. Throughout the week, I would see my students around town, and I would see them walking down a sidewalk, and so I'd look right at them, and you know what they would do? It was like they had just gotten a text to go somewhere else. Later, I would see them, and they would be like this. They'd walk right toward me. What changed between the two times I saw them? They weren't in the word, and they knew I was going to ask them. You know what Hebrews 10, 24 says? Let us consider one another how we can provoke to love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as a man or some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. All of us are supposed to be like youth pastors on the sidewalk, and we're supposed to go up and say, what's the last verse you memorized? Could you share it with me? How is God using that in your life? 
Did you know if you have a friend like that that says that to you every time you see him, either you're going to avoid them or you're going to learn a verse. You see, that's the benefit of Christian fellowship. When I was a pastor of a church, I said, the greatest thing all of you can do on Sunday is instead of saying, where are you going to lunch? What kind of car? Are you guys going on a cruise? Hey, how are your kids doing? Are they winning honors in school? Instead of talking about all the mundane stuff in life, why don't you go up to each other and say, hey, where are you in the Word? What are you getting out of the Word of God? What verse are you memorizing to see God change your life? Did you know right now, every one of you should have a verse that is the verse right now that you're asking, begging God to bring about in your life. You have a problem with saying things you shouldn't say? There's a great verse for that. Set a watch at the door of my mouth that I sin not against you with my tongue. You have a problem with, uh, you know, maybe going into the bad, the dark parts of the internet? There's a verse about that. I will set my eyes upon no wicked thing, Psalm 101. Maybe you have a a problem with uh, always wanting something better. You, there's a verse for that. I've learned to be content, Philippians, Paul said. See, we should have a verse that targets the area. It's kind of like taking medicine, like taking antibiotics. That's what we're supposed to do. We need to start working out, and that's what God wants us to do. Well, how does Jesus cultivate God as a farmer? This whole section, I talk about that. He gives four diagnostics that reveal our spiritual health. Number one is fruitfulness. Number two is worship. Number three is fellowship. And number four is our devotional ministry. And by the way, five of the seven churches were lacking. One of them was suffering and they just had a little trouble with fear. The rest was okay. The other five were desperate and only Laodicea was doing well. The third area, God said, not only love him most and and, uh, to flee sin, but we need to un friend worldliness how many of you have unfriended someone on facebook come on be honest okay you know what i'm talking about it's painful because they find out right unless you do that scary one you know the i mean the secret one but if you really are flat out you just (sniffs) did you know look at james 4 you're in hebrews look at james 4 it actually says in james 4 unfriend worldliness james 4 4 Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What God is saying is, the next verse, do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? God says, I'm jealous. I don't want you looking at everything the world has. I want you engaged to me and have an eye single for me. So he wants us to unfriend worldliness. By the way, what was the first New Testament book? Most likely the book of James. James was the pastor of the first church of Jerusalem. So what's the first New Testament book most people read in the New Testament church? James. And what does James say? Unfriend worldliness. Avoid pleasure-dominated living. Why? Because James 4, 6 says that when I'm proud and do my own thing and the world is all about pride and lust flesh and the pride of life, that hinders my spiritual growth. And most of us don't realize the power of humbling ourselves. God says, I resist the proud, James 4 says, but I pour out my grace on the humble. You want to get a shower, a douse of grace? I always think about those uh, sports things where the winning coach, and they always run up behind him with the big Gatorade cooler, and they go, and dump it on him. That, in my mind, is a picture of but God pours out his grace on the humble. And that's what he wants to do. What are Christ's expectations for his church? Now, what we're doing is looking at all seven together before we look at each church separately. Uh, No other chapters of the Bible are like Revelation 1 to 3. Revelation 1 shows Jesus in his resurrection glory wearing that high priest outfit with those blazing eyes and the white hair and his voice like the sound of many waters but it shows him walking around the churches. See, there's no other chapter of the Bible like that. Five of the seven had neglected key areas, and he points them out. See, Jesus loves us so much, he doesn't let us stay like we are. He's kind of like that coach that says, you need to work on your you know, shot or your dribbling or you need to learn whatever. Uh, a good coach 
always is pointing out the areas we need to improve. Jesus really is wanting to do that. And Jesus said, every church needs to listen to me. That's why it's repeated. As you read Revelation 2 and 3, notice it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. It's that constant, repeated, I want you to hear and respond. And God desires uh, that every one of us uh, be. That's why he wrote down his desires. So, what, what does Jesus want? Number one, Ephesus, love him most. Number two, separate from sin. Number three, we just saw unfriend worldliness. How do we unfriend worldliness? It's James 4. And James 4 says, submit to God, verse 7. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I always remember um, when I was your age, I went I used to write letters to this guy called Brother Andrew. He lived in Ermelo, Holland. And when I was 13 years old, I read God Smuggler. His address was in the back of the book. I started writing him letters. He started writing me back. And from 13 till I was 18, I, w I would send money to him. And when I was 19 years old, I said, I would like to come and smuggle Bibles with you. And believe it or not, he wrote back. I mean, he's a real person. Uh, and he said, sure. He said, just meet me and... Bucharest and you can be on a team and the Lord worked it out uh, not that year but the next year I went and I flew over there and I went to Europe and I was so excited I was going on a Bible smuggling team and I was with a whole bunch of other Christians there were seven of us I'd never met them we all met there we were on this team and we got there and we saw the Lord do remarkable unbelievable things I mean that summer alone we, we took uh, about 50,000 Bibles through the borders into the Iron Curtain countries, and we delivered them to people that had all kinds of scars from their uh, torture that they went through. And it was just an amazing time. On one of those trips, I mean, we were seeing the power of God so much. We came out, we went to Vienna, we got to this rich Christian's house, our team of seven, they said, uh, they gave us each a room, and they gave me the library. And so I went to the library, and I got to this library and I threw my backpack on there and went down the hall to uh, the shower. And when I came back from the shower, on the couch in the library, sitting next to my backpack, was one of the girls from the team. I said, hi. She said, I'm in this room tonight with you. I said, what? She said, yeah. She said, I'm, I'm sleeping in the library on the couch with you tonight. I said, what? I mean, I, is this your room you're assigned? She said, no. She said, I pick one of the boys every night to sleep with. I said, you're a Christian? And I'll never forget that I stepped into the library, grabbed my backpack and pulled it out, and I looked at her and I said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Now, we were both in college. We were in Vienna. We were in a mansion. No one would have known what room which student slept in that night. She was Potiphar's wife. And all I had to do is remember who was watching. You see, God says, I want you to submit to me, whether anybody's watching or not. And that was really a turning point in my life. You know what I found out? Just because someone says they're a Christian on a missions team doesn't mean that they are following Christ or even a Christian. They could be following their own desires. God says, submit to me. To please God, we're also supposed to be overflowing with his spirit. You know how Jesus described in John 7, a Christian life? Out of you will flow rivers of life-giving water. Did you know you and I are supposed to be like a fire hydrant in New York City on a 105 degree day? You know how the firemen come and they crank them and they spray and the kids all jump around in the water coming down? That's what we're supposed to be. We're in the midst of a world parched and dying with no hope and we are like this fire hydrant of life giving water is that how you look on yourself are you letting the holy spirit not only fill you overflow your life you know what keeps the holy spirit from flowing out of us our choices to grieve and quench him so to to overflow with the spirit we stop loving the world. That's what God desires from each of us. And what does that lead to? What's called crucified living. By the way, the seven churches are in the exact same area where Paul wrote the epistle to the Galatians. 
And that area is where he taught crucified living. And for us, we find that Revelation is the culmination and conclusion of all the epistles writing. All that Paul taught, all that Peter taught, all that was taught through Christ was in these churches, and Jesus comes to the churches to see if they're doing what they were taught to do. You see, we read Paul's epistles, and we read Romans, and consecrating yourself, and Colossians, and letting the word of Christ, but most of us don't realize the seven churches Jesus comes to see in each church whether they were doing what the epistles said they were supposed to do. And that's the real essence of why this is so important. For the church on earth, portrait one, the book of Revelation is Christ the great high priest. So for us, the church, Revelation one through three, we see Christ as this visiting the church. But for the church in heaven, they're focused on Christ as the lamb. See, when we're in heaven, we're perfected. We don't, we don't need to be repenting of anything anymore. And so our focus now is just saying thank you to the Lamb. So that's the change. When you get to four and five, the whole tenor of Revelation changes. But for Revelation 6 to 20, it's written with the focus on the rebels that are on earth. And Christ is the warring lion that's coming and judging. So in your notes, Christ's priority today is he wants to be the high priest. Twofold. He's interceding for us when we sin. When we don't deny ungodliness, he comes before the Father and says, that's one of my children. But it doesn't stop there. He's still looking at us and saying, I will not tolerate sin in your life. And I will do whatever it takes for you to repent of that sin. And you can read in your notes the stages of chastening. Sanctification is crucified living. God desires each of us to be crucified. The fifth point there is to please God, we're expected to live crucified. And basically, uh, the famous verse, this is Galatians 2.20. And basically, it goes like this. It's one word. The word crucified is a perfect passive indicative. That's the philology of the word. The summary of what Paul is saying is, this is a fact. I have already been crucified with Christ. The, the scriptures tell us that all of our salvation has already been accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. All we have to do is use our ATM card and by faith make withdrawals on what Christ has already deposited. So if you really believe that you're crucified with Christ, there is no sin that can anymore enslave us. Now, now think about crucifixion. A crucified person was nailed on the cross, and when they were nailed, they couldn't do anything with their hands anymore. They couldn't do anything with their feet, go where they want to go anymore. They only were looking one direction. They couldn't look back, because when you're nailed down, you can't see behind you. The implications of that for the Christian life are staggering. When I'm crucified with Christ, I don't do what I want to do anymore. I don't go where I want to go anymore. I don't look back because my past is buried with Christ. I'm only looking one. I have no future plans except him. And what's that other part, that crown of thorns? Did you know when you're crucified with Christ, you can't wear pride? You're, you're humbled because you're identifying with him. So you can read all that. It's a very powerful truth. Um, it's no longer I who live, but Christ. Uh, you all have heard of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It's a personality transplant. You know how they do skin transplants and liver transplants and kidney transplants? Do you know what Jesus does? Personality transplants. I grew up in a home where my father knocked out my mother. I grew up in a home where my dad disciplined me by choking me until I couldn't breathe. So you know what? I should say... That's how I'm going to be. I was abused, and so I'm going to go through my life living the way I was raised. Yeah, and that's what most people do. They just become completely handicapped by the horrible, warped way they were brought up or abused by that wicked uncle or whatever, their parents or whatever. Instead of saying, I am crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, that old me, 
But now it's Christ that lives inside and out of me. When Christ lives in me, do you know what comes out of me? Love. When love doesn't come out of me, I'm not letting Christ live. I'm living. I'm taking over. Um, my dear wife borrowed the car keys from me. I always keep them in my pocket for this moment, but I'll just demonstrate without it. I always take out my keys and say, being crucified with Christ is like driving a car. I take the keys, I put them in the car, I'm driving along, Jesus is in the driver's seat, and he says, hey, when are you going to let me drive the car? I go, oh, I will. I keep driving. Oh, I will. Mm-hmm. Do you know when I finally choose to surrender to him is when I pull off on the side, put it in park, turn the car off, pull the keys out, get out of my door, walk around to his side, hand him the keys, and say, you take over. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. Now my problem is, I get back in the driver's seat so often, that's why I start the day getting out of bed and saying, Lord, I'm going to give you the car keys from the start of the day. When's the last time you pulled over to the side of the road, stopped everything, and handed the control back to Christ. Paul said, I'm crucified, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. He loved me. He gave himself for me. That's what God desires each of us to be. Well, we're going to have a quiz on Thursday and on Friday. You're going to need to know the seven churches. Now look at that. Do you see the letters? What does E stand for? What does S stand for? How about P? Do something. Do an acronym or something. Because you're going to be asked the churches. And so you should learn those because they are the overview of all of Christ's plan for us today that is shown in this section. Also, you're going to be asked the seven events in Revelation. One, two, and three is John seeing Christ on Patmos and Jesus visiting the church. So it's all on earth. Four and five is around the throne. Six to 18 is a tribulation. This is all in your notes. 19 is second coming. 20, the first part, is the, the whole millennial thing where, where Christ is ruling for a thousand years. The second half of 20 is the great white throne. 21 and 22 are heaven, Okay. So you need to know that. The, this, is, this is what's in your notes, the seven clear events. The seven clear events are Christ church on earth, Christ church in heaven, the whole tribulation, second coming millennium, white throne. You will see that in every possible way to confuse you possible. For example, Christ returns to earth in Revelation 17. True or false? Look up there. Does he return in chapter 17? No. Where does he return? What chapter? Does Christ return to earth in 16? You see how easy it is? How about 14? See, if you just know the grid, when does he return? 19. If it's, if it's Jesus Christ in the millennium, what chapter is that? 12? See? See how easy it is? How about this? Um... When Paul wrote Revelation, is there anything wrong with that statement? Oh. You see, be really careful. This Canva program takes this material and makes these really neat quizzes, which puts a lot of truth next to one thing that's not true. And so the way to to know the answer is just learn the grid. That if it's talking about the seven churches, it's in chapter 2 and 3. It's part of that opening section. If it's talking about the tribulation, it's 6 to 18. Okay? Now, real quickly, when we come back tomorrow, and I only have three minutes to give you this, we're going to go to Ephesus. By the way, this is the best part of Ephesus. That's the only temple column from the great uh, temple to uh, Artemis or Diana that's left. And that's right there in the middle of a swamp. That was one of the seven wonders of the world. But learning to keep loving Jesus supremely. We're going to look at how to have a lifelong uh, passion for Christ. Smyrna, by the way, that's when you're landing into Izmir. That's what you see. And uh, that little green spot right under ending and well, if you go under it, there's a little patch of green. That's the forum of Smyrna. 
and we learn about how to end well. Uh, we're going to go to Pergamum. This is the main the street, and then the Acropolis up there. And Pergamus is all about secret sins and repenting of them. Thyatira, look at those apartment buildings. They're all built right up around the ancient part. Uh, compromise leads to confusion, corruption, and chastisement. We'll look at Samson's life. Sardis, the city was on top of that tall part there, the, the high part. And they used to have a wall all the way around that. And so in Sardis, they stopped guarding the city because no one could climb straight up those cliffs. And that's how the city fell because someone slowly learned how to pick their way up and they crawled up and opened the gates. Uh, this is the church of Philadelphia. <laughs> There's nothing really left of it. Uh, the lesson there is take someone with you to heaven. In fact, if you haven't ever led someone to Christ, I would say, Lord, don't come back until I get the opportunity to slide a track across the you know, the counter to some Daniel in life or sit next to some Paul Bevilacqua that's afraid to fly. Take someone with you to heaven. We'll talk about soul winning. The church in Laodicea, beware of not needing Jesus daily. How long can you go without spending time with the Lord? Most of us can't hold our breath more than about a minute and a half. Most of us get hungry between meals Yet I meet believers all the time that you ask them, when is the last time you really read the Bible because you were so in love with Christ and got something out of it? And they go, I can't remember. That's a sign of being very desperately sick. And, and the whole section we do on the church in Laodicea is learning how we need Christ every day. And that's tomorrow. So wait a minute. We have exactly two minutes, and I'm supposed to allow for questions in every class. So all three class question time is now. Anybody have a question? Oh, oh, yes, sir. And you are, I, I, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Trent. Um, you mentioned earlier, you were the last professor, the one speaking about how we are meeting the being disciplined some of the... I, in an earlier session, I talked about discipline and all that. So today, if someone doesn't uh, take communion with a repentant heart, do you, would you say that they would also be physically disciplined? Or something like that by the Lord? How would that work? Well, uh, chastening, there are two things. Uh, John 15 talks about God pruning us. There's a difference between pruning, which makes you more fruitful, and discipline, which makes you leave a sin. If a, someone came to church, partook of communion, living in in unrepentant sin, it says within that chapter that God will chasten them. What does that chastening look like? There are many things. Uh, one thing is the Bible chronicles three. There is weakness. Now, as a pastor, that's happened to me. I remember this lady. She wrote for Billy Graham. She was a Decision Magazine writer, yet she got so sick, she went to the Mayo, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, and the doctor said nothing is wrong with her, and we found out she had this secret double life, and the Lord made her sick, weak, without